when I expanded the kit store in, in Soho from an 800 square foot space into taking over the whole corner where Atrium was. Right. That was, an, that was an incredible moment for me. Yeah. So I wanted to celebrate that moment by getting myself a watch. And that was the beginning of this uh, concept of celebrating a large, like this, you know, big accomplishment with buying myself a watch. And I was like, okay, like I could get used to this, you know, like if this <laughs> continues to happen. And then that became actually like one of the drivers for me because that felt really good for me. Yeah, you want you know, the new watch. To be able, yeah, to be able to buy that. And the way I looked at it was like, once I bought that watch, I was like, this is like my master's jacket. In green. In green. Yeah. All right, guys, welcome back to Talking Watches. We have a special guest today. We have Mr. Ronnie Feig. Uh, Ronnie is the founder of Kith. Kith is kind of, in, in my opinion, one of the great success stories of, of our generation in, in fashion. And it's such a New York story. I mean, it's like uniquely New York. And you're, you're a New York kid, right? Yeah, yeah. I was born in, uh, and raised in, in Queens. First of all, thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And uh, I appreciate the kind words because I do, I do consider the brand a New York brand. And yeah, we're just um, 13 years in continuously evolving, just like you guys. Sure. You know, and um, happy to be here. So b before you started Kith, what exactly were, were you doing? Because you kind of grew up in, in the sneaker world, I guess. Yeah, I worked um, 15 years for a chain of shoe stores called uh, David Z. Sure. If, and, if you know downtown New York, you know David Z. Yeah, exactly. David Z's were, were stores that, you know, people were coming to, whether you're a tourist or a local. It was kind of like your go-to spot uh, in the 90s. Um, and then the early 2000s. And, and yeah, I worked there 15 years, started in the stock room and kind of worked my way up through um, maybe 10 positions uh, until I, I was buying um, and, and managing a chain of 10 stores. Got it. And so what exactly were you doing there besides like managing the stores? Because I think that, that's like almost like a very 30,000 foot view of what you were doing, like you were responsible for, for picking the product that was going into David Z stores. Yeah, so I was, um, it was at the end, at the end of my career there, um, I was, uh, I was in charge of a lot. So I was in charge of, uh, I was like the, the general buyer for the company. So I was in charge of buying a lot of product and I was working on, um, makeups, which were like exclusive products that were available only there. So I started designing uh, footwear in 07. Mm -hmm. And I designed footwear for four years. So got to like really go to the factories and start working on product and seeing how product was made. And uh, we, we started to offer exclusives there. And that's really um, when the blogs were coming up. Sure. And they started to cover these products that we were offering. So I got to see, I got to see you know, how people shopped, why people liked certain things, and kind of like what, what made people gravitate towards certain products. And started to fall in love with product for different reasons because I got to know people on a personal level for why they liked what they liked. Yeah. And so how did you make the jump from David Z in, into Kith? So in, in 2010, I started to feel like the city needed um, a shop that offered top tier product, exclusive product, um, but with a friendly atmosphere. So like a place that people can call home. I wanted to like build a community for people to come in and spend their time in a space where like-minded individuals can talk about, you know, footwear. Yeah. So Kith opened up as uh, two 800 square foot um, stores, one in Brooklyn, one in Soho simultaneously. And we were um, spaces within Atrium. I don't know if you remember that back in the day. So we had our own entrance, uh, but we also like in, within the space, you can walk between Atrium and our store. And within a year, people wanted to represent the retail space. So like it was a space where people were hanging out and people wanted the retailer to become a brand. Right. Because people wanted to wear a product, yeah. you know, that resembled the shop and people were asking for that. So we started to make some product early on, about a year in, and that started to sell uh, really well, and I had no fucking clue what I was doing. I, I relate, yeah. You know, I had no clue what I was doing, and I was, you know, I was piecing it together the best I could with the people that I knew, Yeah. because I really, I was interested in apparel 
my whole life. And I was as interested in apparel as I was in footwear. I just didn't have, you know, that schooling uh, and that education. So I surrounded myself with some incredible people and had to learn quickly um, how that business worked and how the design process, production development, how all that worked. Um, and then from there, it was uh, an incredible journey. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who knows you, you know, relatively well, like you are a real collector. And so obviously we're gonna talk about watches today, but you collect cars. You obviously collect sneakers quite, quite famously. Right. Um, I mean, so it's, you're somebody that really kind of like walks the walk and talks the talk. Like this is not just your business, this is your life. Yeah, and I've been collecting since a young age, like, but for, I'm, I'm still collecting products, you know, and, and you're gonna see here, like it, it's, it's evolved. I still am stuck in the past, so I'm still collecting uh, footwear from the early 2000s, like late 90s to early 2000s. I'm still obsessed with that era. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm like chasing, owning that era yeah. as much as I can as I grow older. And I have, you know, my second kid now. Uh, it's just becoming, um, it's, 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 I don't want to forget those moments. And that's the way I, that's the way I tend to remember them. Yeah, I mean, it, it's something of a, of a sentimentalist approach towards, towards collecting. For sure. And that it, it seems like that kind of applies to, to the watches here. So why don't, why don't we go through a few of these? Yeah, sounds um, good. So where do you want to start? I think the F1 watch is probably the most important watch in my lifetime because I think I was 12 years old uh, when I got my first uh, real watch. And that was uh, my mother actually used to be a salesperson at Torneau. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, so she came home uh, for my birthday when I was 12 uh, and she hit her goal uh, and I'll never forget because she was so happy that she hit her goal and like was able to afford to buy me, you know, because my parents didn't have uh, a lot of money when I, when I was growing up. So I had to go and work at an early age to be able to buy the things I wanted to wear. Um, but this one time I remember it really stands out when she came home with that watch and um, it was the 28 millimeter uh, F1, so that's this guy. Uh, and this was my first watch, so I obviously had to start my collection there, and that started a, lo a very long time ago. But the 28 millimeter was very small, and it seems extremely small for us today, but during that time, you know, for a 12 year old, this was an incredible watch to have. Oh, that's an insane watch to have for a 12 year old. Yeah, and, and, and I remember like a lot of my friends getting extremely jealous and I absolutely destroyed this watch. Yeah. So I was very happy to start collecting uh, and I was able to get incredible F1s out of Japan mostly. And it's crazy that people in Japan were collecting back then not knowing what it would be worth today. Right. And they just kept it new, which yeah. is insane. That's very Japanese. Yes, very Japanese and very inspiring to me. Ever, ever since going uh, to Tokyo, the first time I, I was able to visit there, uh, I just, I, I fell in love with collecting even more, you know? So when I get interested in a product, um, I'm always, I'm always doing the research to see what surrounds that product. Right. And I start to get into that world, you know? It seems like you're pretty deep in the F1 world. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that became the most important watch to me. Um, and then as you start to learn about it, Eddie Bregenner, who designed the watch, you know, um, and in 1986, when it released, it was like, you know, Quartz was having this crazy run, yeah. you know, from the late 70s into the 80s. Um, and then these colorful watches were very bold for the time. And it was such a crazy contrast between what Tag was doing versus everybody else, you know, and they took these like diver watch cues and applied them to racing watches, yeah. you know? And F1 was very loud and bold, and they got the drivers to wear the watches. And at the time, they were, you know, this was pinnacle. And people were loving these watches for, the, for great reasons, because it was fun. Right. You know, and not to be taken too seriously, but at the same time, great product. And all of these look like they're brand new. So they are brand new. So the straps are uncut, which means that they were never sized. That's crazy. Yeah, and um, very hard to find in these type of conditions. And one at a time, it becomes an incredible collection. And you have the 35s and then you have the 37 chronos uh, also. The Katayama colorway, which has a signature, uh, probably my favorite out of all of these, except for the first, obviously. Sure. Uh, but I loved, I loved that they, um, they took the chance, you know, and 
they were able to push the boundaries. And this reminds me kind of like my own philosophy on product where, you know, you push the envelope and you give people something that they haven't seen before. People accept it, right? And then what they were able to build around that, because I believe that there were, you know, 40 or 50 colorways of these, of these watches. And that's just an incredible journey that they were able to take with this watch. No, it, it really is. And so, so this was certainly the most formative watch of, of your youth. Um, but now, you know, you have quite a few green dial Rolexes here. Yeah. So early on, when I expanded the kit store in, in Soho from an 800 square foot space into taking over the whole corner where Atrium was, right. um, that, was an, an, that was an incredible moment for me. Yeah. So I, I owned, uh, at the time, I owned a Pepsi GMT. Uh, and it was an old one, and I got it from my friend Greg, and uh, I gave that watch to my dad when I got my first green face Rolex, which was the Hulk. So I wanted to celebrate that moment by getting myself a watch. And that was the beginning of this uh, concept of celebrating a large, like this, you know, big accomplishment with buying myself a watch. And I was like, okay, like I could get used to this, you know, like if this <laughs> continues to happen. And then that became actually like, one of the drivers for me because that felt really good for me yeah you want you know, the new watch to be able yeah to be able to buy that and the way i looked at it was like once i bought that watch i was like this is like my master's jacket in green in green yeah you know what i'm saying and when i put it on i was like okay like this is real like this moment is real and we opened up that first space and it was incredible um i'll never forget that moment you know travis scott performed and we had these casts hanging from the ceiling and uh, all I remember is I was sitting in the corner watching Travis perform, and I, w I was just scared that one of these casts were gonna fall on someone's head. And Travis is on the microphone, where the fuck is Ronnie? And he's looking for me, and I'm sitting in the back, and I'm just like scared that like, one of those casts are gonna fall on someone's head. So that was, that was an incredible moment, and um, obviously that space, um, which then later turned into a Nike kit space on the corner, just turned into like um, one of these like iconic spaces that if you were in the city, I think most people in our world wanted to stop by. Yeah. And then I opened up the next space in Miami um, in 2016. And for that time, you know, I'll never forget uh, the Daytona. The first time I saw that watch, the gold and green, like something clicked for me. Yeah. You know, like I really, I love that combination, yellow, gold, and green. And I had a friend that worked in a shop, and I don't, I don't even remember the name of the shop, but it was in Miami. Mm -hmm. And they sent me a picture of like their available watches that they had because yeah. I was waiting to buy one when I opened the store. I was, yeah. When I went to Miami for the opening, I was like, I need to buy a watch. They sent me photos and I walked in and I bought the Greenface Daytona. I didn't own any Daytonas before that, and that mm -hmm. was my first Daytona. That's um, a good one. And the only reason I bought it is because of the way, the, the color combination could have been on any watch to be honest but then i fell in love with Day the daytona once i started wearing that watch yep. now i have a few daytonas but that's a that's a, one of the most important ones in the collection because as we you know go into you know opening la and then tokyo and then paris and then uh so on and so forth then the presidents then became like this like mini collection of green face presidents which yep. i the presidential has always been um for me like you know when biggie wore the presidential that was always like a sign of some sort of success story. It is to me. It, it really is, and I think what's funny with like in internally at Rolex, this is their flagship watch, like right. the Daytona and the Sub and all that. Like okay, like that's cool sports watches for sure. But the the day date has always been kind of the Rolex flagship, and I, I have the, the same fascination with it. Like my my grandfather, who gave me my Omega that made me start Hodinkee, he oh, wore yeah. a yellow gold day date as well. So when I turned 40, I got a day date. I mean, it's just like, it's kind of the, the ultimate grown man's watch. Yeah, you know? yeah. And the 40, you know, it's it's a little big, uh, but, you know, I learned to love these, you know, as I've worn them. Yeah. Um, you just love them more and more because it's, it's such an iconic, timeless piece that, and I've read a lot of stories about the evolution of the gold watch, mm -hmm. you know, and what the gold watch meant for Rolex back in the day. Um, it was for the businessman, sure. you know, it was for, you know, the, the more affluent businessman. Um, and you would kind of like look up to that watch in that way, right? Okay. So if you had a gold watch, it was like, wow. So 
to me, it was like not even about that until uh, I got my first when we opened up LA and then I fell in love with the day date. Mm -hmm. And then I had to have, once I had the, the green face and then they started to evolve into other metals and other green faces, I just, I needed to have all the green faces. And you know what's funny is like, I wasn't consciously, you know, doing that until probably the, the third watch where I was like, oh, like now I need to make sure I have all the green face Rolexes. And so, that's gonna continue, I take it? Yeah, so I actually have all the green face <laughs> Rolexes. <laughs> they're just not they're just not here because, yeah. you know, like uh I have uh I have a date just and I have the sprite and I have like a couple of other ones. But it's um to me these five meant the most because these are like the most five iconic, you know, moments in opening spaces. So like when we opened up uh Tokyo and then we opened up Paris and became an international brand. Mm -hmm. These are the moments now that I remember, like this is, these are like notches in the timeline that could be identified through watches. It's amazing. So what are the stories behind these? All right, so in the stages of collecting watches, the hardest watch for me to figure out how to buy, what were these, you know, were these Aquanauts. Yeah. So for my 40th birthday, my wife, she became good friends with uh, one of the guys at Wempe mm -hmm. and, and, you know, he made her wait, but she really started digging into this a year before she bought it for me. I'm sure. You know, so two years ago for my 40th birthday, um, she was able to get me that watch and then I fell in love with it and then I wanted another version of that watch. So I've been, I was chasing this watch before any of the others. I just really wanted the orange band. I felt like it was incredible. I didn't care how limited it was. I just felt like it was a, a really incredible watch. I wanted it for four years, yeah. right? When I first saw it and um, really, really hard to get because I think every boutique gets like one or one a year. Something and like that. yeah, something like that. And, um, and I never put it on, I always wanted it. And then after wearing, you know, the, the rose gold, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted another one, but then when I finally got to buy the Chrono in stainless, I felt, um, I always thought that they were the same size. But they're not. But they're not the same size. I know. You're not the first person to have this issue. And then I put it on and I was like, this watch is too big for me. And I really wanted it and it's really pretty to look at. And I've been wearing it, you know, so like now, like, uh, I haven't gotten much wear out of it just because I feel like it's too big to wear unless you like doing some kind of sporty activity. Yeah. Right. Some, for some reason, I feel like sporty activities deserve like, you know, a bigger face. I get you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I wear, you know, I wear it when I go, um, ironically, like I wear it to the beach and I actually like, I use the watches. So like, you know, I'll go in the ocean, whatever, like that's what they're made for. Sure. So, uh, I got a little less wear out of that one, but that watch meant a lot for me because it took me like almost five years to get. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing also. And for, for the, the, the washers at home, you know, Somebody like Ronnie, who presumably has a lot of famous people in his cell phone, still has to wait five years. Ed Sheeran famously on one of these episodes said it took him five years to get the 5711. It's amazing that like it really is that hard to get it. I think a lot of people don't think that's real, but it's definitely real. Yeah, it's definitely real. And the 5711 is beautiful, actually, also. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's worth it, though. And I think that that's what's fun about collecting watches is it becomes a chase, is what I'm saying. Sure does. You know yeah. what I mean, and it becomes harder... Uh, it's harder to find watches. I have so many people around the world for footwear, but when it comes to watches, it becomes really difficult to get them in, the, in pristine shape. Yeah. And so it looks like you, you collect in sets. So you've got the, yes. the green dial Rolex, you've got the Aquanauts, and you have three. Yeah. Double balance wheel. Yeah. Keith? So the double balance wheel, funny story about this watch. I was um, in California. I met up with Maverick Carter and he was wearing this insane black ceramic AP. And I was like, bro, what is that watch? And he was like, Ronnie, I love this watch. I was like, I know. What is it? How'd you get it? And he started to tell me that uh, he knew the guys over at AP. And I was like, dude, you got to put me in touch. And he was like, I'll put you in touch. I'll put you in touch. And I was like, he's never going to put me in touch. Right. <laughs> and um, I wake up the next day and he put me in touch with Francois. Um, and this is a while back. So um, I had a few conversations uh, over email and, you know, he told me, he's like, send me, send me what you, what you like, like send me what you wish to have. And I was like, I really, and I started to do some research and I, I really wanted um this watch yeah right so the black ceramic double wheel and i was i was uh 
very excited to see if I can get it. And uh, he was like, oh, I, I, can't, I can't get you one of those. Those are really tough. Um, but I could get you the gold one. So he sent me the gold one, and I wore this a lot. And I, I actually really love this watch. Um, and this became my favorite watch in the collection for a while. Uh, and then I was like, okay, like six months passed and I was like, okay, I really want the black one now too. Cause I've been wearing that watch a lot. And he was like, oh, you, you have to wait now, you know? So That's very Francois. Yeah. And Francois made me wait a long time, uh, before I was able to get the black. And then the last actually was a stainless, which I haven't even got sized yet. So I was very, uh, happy to round out and finish off the collection by having all three medals. Um, yeah, I don't know anybody else that has all three medals of, of double balance wheels. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that this is one of the best APs uh, to date. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And then finally, we have two Vacherons, which is kind of an unusual choice, I, I would say. You know, Vacheron is not a brand that we often see in, in, yeah. in collections like this. So when you say like this, what do you mean by that? Younger guys, honestly. Yeah. That's what I mean. So, I mean, you know, with the exception, with the exception of the 222, Vacheron has, I would say, struggled to get into... Younger, more stylish collections, I would say. So Vacheron really wasn't on my radar. Um, I knew it was a, I knew it was, a, I've heard of it. I knew it was an incredible brand, but I, none of my friends ever wore it. Right. And I've never been in a Vacheron store just because I was never interested to walk in. Yeah. Um, so we're on, uh, we're walking on Rodeo not long ago. Actually, this might be like a year and change ago. And um, I walk in and one of the ladies that's working there, like, we opened the store off Rodeo, so she knew I was and knew about the store and was excited to tell me that she went to the store and that she loved the store. And she was like, um, sit down, sit down. I want to show you some stuff. Yeah. And she showed me a few watches and she showed me a 222. And I knew nothing about the 222. Yeah. And as I started to look at the watch, I, uh, I asked her about it. I was like, what is this watch? And she was like, well, that's our most popular model. Like Everybody is chasing this watch now because... Brad Pitt wore it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And she started to explain uh, the history, a bit of the history about the watch. And I looked at it and I put it on and I was like, okay, I really like this watch. And she was like, well, so does everybody. And um, that's the hardest watch to get. You know, like we can't just let you buy that as your first watch. Yeah. So I was like, okay, thank you. Uh, I, love, I love what you're showing me, but you know, this is the only watch I'm interested in, right? So I gave her, you know, she took my info down and then maybe four or five months after I get a phone call and it was uh, actually a different, it was the manager of the store that called me and then offered me uh, the ability to buy one. Mm -hmm. So this ended up being my first Vacheron watch. And then I wore this a few times and I really loved the bracelet. I think that that's what people love about it, right? It's just how thin the case is and then the bracelet, which I think is really beautiful. So, so I started to do some research about it because I wanted to get another color or another metal. Uh, and as I, um, as I did some research about the watch, uh, I saw they only had the two-tone uh, new. And then if you start looking back, then you can get some vintage, you know, in, in stainless. Yep. But then I went further than that, and I wanted to see, like, all of their old watches. And then I, I ran into this watch online, and it was basically the only version of this watch that I could find in this color. And... He just happened to put it up for sale a couple of days before I started researching this watch, which is a crazy coincidence. And I, uh, I reached out and I told the guy, I was like, okay, I want to buy it, you know? And he was like, oh, it's on reserve. I'm sorry. Sure. Like, I'm going to let you know in, you know, I have this 24 hour hold policy and I'm holding it for somebody. Got it. Right. So I called the guy from the Vacheron store in Rodeo and I told him, hey, like, uh, I really want this watch. Do you know anything about it? But he's like, oh my God, that's an incredible watch. Actually, Brad Pitt is kind of looking at that same watch because he sent me the same photo. I just didn't know if it was authentic or not because I've never seen this color before. Yeah. Right? And I was like, oh, is that who's, who's putting the watch on hold? He was like, uh, I'm not sure, but chances are, you know, maybe. So after doing some diligence with the guy who was selling the watch, 24 hours later, I was like, listen, the guy called back for the watch and he was like, uh, no, but I need to give him a few more hours. I was like, no, you need to tell me now. Otherwise I'm, you know, I'm off it. And yeah. I kind of like stressed him for it. Um, but I, but I asked him about the watch and, and, and the colorway of the watch, the color combination of the bezel, uh, because I couldn't find anything about it. But, yeah. it, but then I saw the papers from Vashon and he sent it to get, uh, 
he sent it to get uh, serviced. Sure. So I sent the paperwork to the guy from Vacheron and he validated it That's and, amazing. and I was able to get it. So in 1975, they actually made uh, the 2215 for two years before they started making the 222. Yeah. And uh, they made very, very few of them. So this might be the only, uh, the only watch in this metal, in this color to be in working condition today. It's crazy. Yeah, which is great. So I, I actually, I, I thought the watch looked extremely modern. Uh, I felt like it, it, it was actually like a design that would be super relevant today. And I felt like the rectangular face is something that people are starting to pay attention, pay more attention to today now. No question. If you look at every watch on this table, even the watches on straps, the straps are integrated into the case. So you don't like watches where you can even see a little bit of air between the, the yeah, strap and the so case. Yeah, so I told you that before. I don't yeah. like, I, I can't wear watches that don't have an integrated strap, whether it's a leather strap, a rubber strap, or, you know, or a metal bracelet. You know, I've been doing this for 16 years. I've never heard anybody say that ever. You're the first that's, person to ever say that. That's really crazy because, and this is like, you know, uh, less than a quarter of my collection, but if you look at all of the watches I own. There's not a single one. Not a single one. That's wild. Nice. That is such a like, nuanced, particular thing to not like. Yeah, I, I just, respect that. I just, I can't, uh, because it, when, when you think about the design that goes into the watch itself, like into the case, into the movement, yeah. like go the extra mile and just give me a- Like one cohesive- a, Give me one okay. cohesive strap that actually fits exactly to the case of the watch. Otherwise it looks like any strap can be aftermarket. Right. You know, which, which is I, true. Which, it is. Yeah. Uh, but I like straps that are made specifically for the watch Got it. and not something that you can get, you know, in the aftermarket. Got it. That is incredibly particular. It really is. Yeah, I just, I like what I like, you know, and, and, <laughs> that's, and that's, sure, yeah. that's, that's, that's the thing too, is like all of the watches that I collect, every single watch I collect, I need to be able to wear. Right. Like I won't collect a watch just to collect it and just to have it, you know, different for footwear because like certain footwear pieces now I can't even wear because they're not wearable. You know, yeah. shoes from the 90s, like they're breaking apart. Yeah. But I still, I, I still want to collect them because it, to me it like resembles an era for me more than watches. Yeah. Watches, I think, have more of a function for me and, you know, I like to wear them. Amazing collection. What's the dream watch for you? To be completely honest with you, I don't, I don't have like a dream watch that I don't have. Right. That I don't currently have. I have a dream project on a watch that hasn't happened yet. And uh, we're working with TAG on a project which I'm very, very, very excited about. And I think that that's my dream scenario. Okay. And again, because you're you, what's like the holy grail sneaker? You have, I'm sure, everything, but is there one thing that you, you just always wanted and could never get your hands on? Uh, yes, there's a brown croc HTM Air Force One. And I won't, they all have to be 10 and a half, right? And they all have to be brand new, 10 and a half and brand new. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm waiting to find those. I mean, I think that that era of HTM is just, a crazy, uh, a crazy era of incredible footwear that were designed by incredible visionaries. And I haven't been able to get my hands on it, which is upsetting. I can it's imagine. Really I, can I was, was, was going to get the 12, but I was like, that will be the only non 10 and a half in my collection. I'm not yeah, going to do that. You can't do that. Right? No, yeah. no. So I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to wait and until one of those pop up. It's, it's, I have two girls now. So I was supposed to go to like, supposed to go to my future son, but yeah. I don't think that that's, uh, that's in the cards <laughs> for me. Not yet. Anyway. <laughs> uh, and then you've collaborated famously with BMW. What's yes. the dream BMW? Um, the dream BMW has always been an M1. I think that's the greatest BMW of all time, uh, designed by Lamborghini, yeah. you know, a year before I was born, 81. Also the design lines from that time, I think are some of the best lines ever in, uh, the auto industry. T to me, the, it, to me, it's the M1, 850, and then the M6. Got it. Those are my favorite designed uh, cars. The funnest to drive and the most iconic is obviously the E30. Mm -hmm. And you have a few of those. Got a few of those. I actually have, I think I'm the only one in the States with a convertible and that's been fun to drive. That's cool. And I drive all of them a lot. And I, I you know, I, I um, those cars also similar to like the watches, I only collect what I want to, drive and beat the shit out of right and just collecting i think it's a crazy hobby because especially uh when you talk about footwear then it's you know it's the storage units it's temperature controlled it's managing you know the catalog it's making sure that you know the shoes 
stay as pristine as possible. And then on the car side, it's like a lot harder to collect because yes. the, the, ma- the maintenance on the cars are, are really crazy. So you got to yeah. keep driving them. Yeah, cars are a whole different. Whole different yeah, I, watches are not very hard to maintain. That's for sure. You know what I mean? I do. Uh, Ronnie, thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure. Yeah, an thanks honor. a lot. Hope thanks to see for you again soon.